I want to talk today about the nature of an enemy of Israel. And my title, which is Knowing Our Enemy. Let me say here that I reject uniformly everything that's said about the struggle in Israel. I do not agree anything about peace talks. I don't think that any diplomatic maneuvers will make any difference because the roots to this go far beyond this century. And so therefore, I mean, So this is going to be a little radical in that sense. Uh, but I can't change my ways. I've been radical all my life. So anyway, the story with Muhammad is where we need to start in order to understand what is happening in Israel. Because what we see with, for instance, Islamic State, which I prefer to ISIS, for simply because it calls it out for being what it is. It is Islamic State. And let me say categorically that everything that Islamic State is doing has its precedence in the Sunnah of Muhammad. So when people say, oh, that's, for instance, Obama is the President of the United States, he says, and Kerry, Secretary of State, says, well, this has nothing to do with Islam. I go, I don't think so. I see all of this in the Sirah. So, having said that I want to start from a different point of view, I'm going to start with Muhammad. Because Muhammad has an interesting relationship with the Jews. As a matter of fact, if it were not for the Jews, he couldn't have gotten his train moving at all. If you're a middle-aged man, and you suddenly go out and tell the world that God is speaking to you, and not only is he speaking to you, but he's telling everyone else that they're supposed to listen to Muhammad and do what he says. Let me assure you that if you try to do that, you're going to get some pushback. You're going to be like, what? What do you mean God's talking to you and we ought to do what you say? What Muhammad did to verify the nature of what he did was to basically declare himself to be the last of the Jewish prophets. He put his caboose on the train of the prophets of Islam, of, of the Jews. And really that shapes what the Quran is. Briefly, there's two Qurans, which we'll get to later. But there's an early Quran written in Mecca, which is very Jewish. All right? We meet Moses again and again. The story of Moses is told 38 times. The story of Noah is told 29 times. Why is he talking so much about the Jewish prophets? Because you see, he says that the angel, archangel Gabriel, who's speaking to him, was the same who spoke to Moses, who spoke to Noah, and who spoke to everyone else. And so the nature of the early Quran written in Mecca is, Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. That can summarize what the early Quran is. And this is repeated again and again. When you read the story of Noah, you realize that Noah and Moses all had the same problem. They were appearing in front of powerful people, and they said, oh, we don't believe in your God Allah, and so bad things happen when you don't believe that. So he uses the story of the Jewish prophets to establish himself as the prophet of the law. Now he was working in good territory because you see there were no other Jews around in Mecca to say, uh-uh, he's not the prophet of the law. So he, oh, wait, we're having, ooh, we're having a technical moment. You're going to have to put up with this. So he's the caboose on the Jewish train. Let me say other one thing here. When you're reading the early Quran, when in Mecca, and you read again and again about Moses and Noah, you understand that the Quran is a derivative work. I don't need to this. <laughs> From the tech out. Anyway, the Quran is a derivative work. If you studied world religions and you read the Quran, you realize the bridge over hell comes from Zoroastrianism. The Jewish prophets obviously come from the Jews. And then later you see that everything is a derived from what was around him. Okay. I'm having to read. Uh, by the way, I wrote this whole talk to, today on the plane. All right. After 13 years of being in Mecca, he produced 150 followers. He also left behind a community in Mecca which was a little irritated with him. They were so irritated that they said, we want you to leave. And so they left and he went to Medina. Now in Medina, he became, instead of the prophet of Allah, he still held that title, but he expanded into being a politician and a jihadist. Now we have success. There's a growth curve that goes with Islam. It's really easy to see. For 13 years, the preaching of the Quran by Muhammad the prophet 
produced 150 followers. If he had continued with the religion of Islam and had lived another 10 years, there would have been less than a thousand Muslims around. So, the change was necessary for growth. When he moved to Medina at the insistence of the Mecans, this is called the immigration. Here's how important the immigration is. If you ask yourself, when would the Arabic, or not the Arabic, the Islamic calendar begin, you say, well, probably on the first night of the Revelation. Seems logical. Well, or maybe it was the birth of Muhammad. Well, no, the calendar begins with the immigration to move to Medina. Why? Because Medina was successful. After 10 years of becoming a politician and a jihadist, he averaged an event of violence on the average of every six weeks for the last nine years of his life. And what did this produce? Overwhelming success. When he died, basically every Arab was a Muslim. When he arrived in Medina, and he was invited to Medina because there had been a civil war going on. A civil war in which there were two Arab tribes, and there were three Jewish tribes, and the Jewish tribes participated along with the, they chose sides in the civil war. So Muhammad's coming in was to be a peacemaker. Now let me say this, before Muhammad became the prophet of Allah, he was a peacemaker. This is recorded in the Sirah. He solved arguments, and so he was brought to Medina to do the same thing. This was not a novel idea in the Arab world. They had also done, had religious teachers to be brought in to solve civil war problems. When he got there, he participated, he worked with all five tribes to produce what we could call a constitution. And indeed, some Muslims make a great deal of saying that one of the first constitutions was written by Muhammad. Well, this is possibly true. However, this constitution had an ill effect in terms of history, because two years after Muhammad moved to Medina, it was June 9, cleansed of Jews. There were three Jewish tribes. The first tribe was exiled, minus their goods. The second tribe was exiled, minus their goods. The third tribe didn't do so well. The women were sold into slavery. The children were adopted into Muslim families. And there was that day in the uh, marketplace in Medina when Muhammad sat beside his favorite wife, who is now, mm, she, she's nine years, she's now 11 years old. I think I've got that right. And 800 male Jews were brought in. Some say 700, some say 600. Doesn't really make that much difference. And they lost their heads. This business of ISIS, Islamic State, cutting people's heads off, you can do a whole study of a heading in the Sirah and the Hadith. One of my favorite, just in terms of, I, by the way, find all this material very fascinating. And the Hadith are wonderful reading. Since they're not, since it's not a serial story, you can just pick them up and read them one after another. Oh, I just suddenly realized something. I forgot to start my stopwatch. Oh, well, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, the clock on the wall. <laughs> Okay, where was I? Remember the fatigue thing of being old and now lost my drink? The behave. Ah, yes. <laughs> it's our problem. But one of my favorite hadith is Muhammad sent out an assassin to take care of one of his political enemies. His, the head of his enemy was thrown at his feet and he laughed so loud you could see his back teeth. So no wonder that image is so graphic. So an Islamic state is cutting off heads. It's an old custom. There's more than once in the, of course, the biggest mass assassination was those of the Jews. Incoming. All right, so we have the headings. Now that what has happened is, is now Islam has cleansed Medina of the Jews. Now there's something to be interesting here because it teaches us a lesson. The three Jewish tribes never wised up. <coughs> they never got it together. They never formed a unity against Muhammad. Each one thought they could work it out so it would be good. It didn't work out. I think there's a lesson to be seen here, is that there was earlier talk about building a community and even a con uh, common strategy. Sometimes people look at me and go, wow, you're like David against Goliath. That doesn't work. 
In America, we have a favorite myth. And the myth goes like this. There's a hero, usually carrying a weapon. And he comes into a town that's corrupt and oppressed. And by his courage and his skill with weapons, he destroys the oppressors. Superman, Dirty Harry, uh, Dirty Harry, Lone Ranger, I don't know how much of American culture has seeped up this far, but it's a favorite American myth that one person can turn back an entire army. News break, it don't work. An individual might sustain himself against a very small group. But when that gets very large, individuals can't do this work. It won't work. It never has and never will. Again, speaking to Elsa's point, we're going to have to come together or we'll be like the three Jewish tribes. One at a time. Now, you would think that his battle against the Jews would stop there. But it did not. One of the interesting things about Islamic ethics is this. It does not have a golden rule. Because a golden rule is symmetric. Treat others as you would be treating themselves. This is a symmetry between you and the other person. And by the way, which others? Well, all others. So it's a, a unitary, perfect symmetry ethical statement. But in Islam, there's a, another creature called the kafir, K-A-F-I-R. I always use the word kafir, I never use the word infidel, never use the word unbeliever, because kafir is very unique. Indeed, as we'll see later, the most of Islamic doctrine, Quran, Sirah, Hadith, is about the kafir. I find this sort of fascinating. That is, we assemble on the subjects of the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith, the doctrine of Islam. That tells us something. Okay. So, when we see Muhammad as a neighbor, he attacked every single neighbor he had. There were no exceptions. He attacked the pagans first, the polytheists. He then attacked the Jews. And once he destroyed the Jews in Medina, he went further. Because there was a tribe of Jews in a town called Khaybar. K-H-A-Y-B-A-R. Were they bothering Muhammad? Well, by their existence, they were. So he took Kaibar, he took his warriors to Kaibar, and there he beat them. And the Jews became something unique in history. They were called a Dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I. Now this is, a Dhimma is a contract. And so the Jews signed a contract as to what they would do. And basically what they said they would do is they would become very small. That is, Judaism would exist in their house and their synagogue but the public would be ruled by the Sharia. So they are living by the Sharia as the first dimmies. Now later, there were other dimmies, but they were to come later. The Christians became dimmies as well. Other things were established with the Jews in Kaibar. Not only were they first dimmies, we also have that the Hadith lay out the first rules for sex slaves. How are you to take captured women and have sex with them? come back to Islamic State. They didn't make this up. They sold slaves in the marketplace, sex slaves. Did you know that the highest priced slave in the Megan slave market, which closed down in 1964, was always the same one, a white woman? Why? Because it is the Sunnah of Muhammad. One of Muhammad's favorite sexual partners was Mary. She was fair of skin, curly hair. She was a Christian. She was a Coptic Christian, and she was a gift. So therefore, the Sunnah of Muhammad is, the ultimate sexual partner is a white sex slave. So when, there's, when the Azizi women and the Christian women are on the slave block, it is Islam. The rules were given on how to rape those whom the right hand possesses. And basically the rules were simple. She was not to be raped, she's having a period. She was not to be raped if she was with child. Let's see, there's one other thing established in Kaibar, but I don't recall it at the moment. So we see, though, that the history of the Jew and Muhammad are intertwined. Basically, Muhammad first announced himself as being a Jew, in a sense. Okay? Not 
racially, uh, but he picked up the culture and carried it forward. Oh, there was the heading down at Kaibar as well. There was known to be treasure buried there, and so they brought forth the leader of the Jews, and they said, we know you have a treasure buried. Tell us where it is. He didn't tell them. So they staked him out on the ground and built a small fire on his chest. When he still wouldn't tell where the treasure was, they untied him and brought him to, over to a jihadist who had lost a brother in the battle, and he beheaded him. So we just return to this constant theme of beheading. Now then, what I would like to do is we're going to use these slides here, and I did not have time. I'm doing a five-city tour of Canada. It's somewhat discombobulating. I'm told I get to sleep late in the morning, though. That's a good thing. Let's see. I'm, I'm going to steal... Oh, talk to me. That was supposed to work. Ah. I want to start out here talking about the rationality of what I do. There are two ways to learn about Islam. The favorite method in America is you ask a Muslim. This has an overwhelming advantage. If you get to define Islam by what a Muslim says, you get the Islam you want. Right? You find the person who tells you what you want, you say, that's Islam. But of course, if you ask a jihadi, you'll get another answer which you may not like. What I say is that Islam is a doctrine. And by the way, let me make a mention here. I'm only interested in the doctrine of Islam as it applies to me. Call me self-centered. That's all I care about. And furthermore, I define the doctrine of Islam that deals with me since I am totally outside the religion of Islam. It's what I want to know about how I'm treated. And we've also been, we've been discussing so far the Jews and how they were treated. Remember, this is the Sunnah, as you the the Sunnah of Muhammad. It is eternal power. There are 92 verses in the Quran which declare that Muhammad is the perfect example. If you don't do it in Muhammad's way, you'll go to hell. If you do it in Muhammad's way, you'll go to heaven. Now there is an odd verse in there which is somewhat discombobulating in which Allah says, I have created both men and jinn to burn in hell. So there's always an uncertainty factor here. Okay. Now we're going to try to... Uh, Oh, the other thing is, is I like rational thought. Now, what happens in America is this rarely happens. Instead, for instance, I've given a lot of talks. Uh, by whom I should have told you this. You may want to run through the door. There's a group in America called the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has declared that I'm one of America's top ten biggest. When I was young, they said I'd never amount to nothing. <laughs> Committee on American Islamic Relations has also declared that I'm part of the inner circle of hate. So, anyway, the point I'm making is this is that people don't tell me there aren't 92 verses which say that they follow Muhammad. What they say is, Bill's a bigot. That has become practice, is what unfortunately political talk is. America, political speech changed from 9 11, it became vicious and character assassinations. Instead of saying that I don't like George Bush's policy, I do not know how many times I've heard this. Bush is an idiot. Okay? There's, those are two separate statements. One to examine policy, and the other to, to call them bad names. Those are different ways of reasoning. I say it's possible to be logical. Um, by the way, I also contend that it is possible for me, a Kafir, to understand this doctrine of Islam without the Kafir. Or in America, uh, and it work that way. Only Muslims can understand this law. I reject that. As a matter of fact, I'm somewhat intrigued, somebody would tell me that there's something I cannot understand. That makes me go, really? I don't want a piece of that. Um, I say that we need to study the history of jihad and the history of the Demi. The history of the persecuted church. In America, Christians know nothing about the persecuted church. You can't find a Christian in America who can tell you how Turkey went from being. They don't even know it used to. 
Did you know that Iraq used to be Christian? Americans don't know that. Turkey was Christian. North Africa was Christian. You can, I say you can't find any. I'm describing 90% of the Christians in America. We can't tell you. Well, St. Augustine wrote in North Africa. What happened? I claim that we need to know the history of jihad. Well, here's an interesting fact for you. I was amazed at this question that had never been answered. How many people have died in jihad? It's a reasonable question. In America, you can find a bunch of people who can tell you, well, here's how many Jews died. But they can't tell you how many people died in jihad. A rough approximation is 60 million Christians, 10 million Buddhists, 80 million Hindus, and 120 million Africans. I call that the tears of jihad. This history is not taught in America. I keep saying America, I'm in Canada, I do not know what you all do. <laughs> so I'm not going to say what you do and what you don't do. I just talk about America, I know. Okay, I'm also a fervent believer in free speech. Now in America we have a constitutional right to free speech. However, you will be greatly abused if you say something that the progressives do not like. I've had no less than four articles written about me in the largest paper in Tennessee. Never once did they refute anything I said. They just said, he's a hater, he's a bigot, he's a KKK, he's neo-Nazi. I'm also called a merchant of hate. I sell books. By the way, these books really say Allah and Muhammad, but for that, it's hate speech, I guess, if I said. So I'm a firm believer in free speech, and I'll listen to anybody's argument. In America, we've created something called hate speech which is worse than mass murder. You can kill people, and they won't put you on the front page of the paper. But if I say something that's politically incorrect in a talk, I can wind up on the front page of the paper. I am telling you factual information here. By the way, the first article about me was on the Sunday edition above the fold. That's right. OK. Um, and by the way, I do not care anything at all about the religion of Islam. Don't speak about it, don't condemn it, don't praise it, don't do anything about the religion of Islam. I wish everybody had the best after death. I'm not a Muslim. What I care about is how Islam treats me. Call me self-centered. So all I talk about is the politics of Islam. Nothing at all about the religion. Now, I'll be true, I don't know. I understand what they say about me, I don't know why. Uh, let's see, we're going to try this slide thing here. I'm going in the wrong direction, I think. No. Anyway, what I want to do is to study a rational uh, study of Islam. I want to use a precise language. Language is incredibly precise or imprecise, and as imprecise as the language is, is how fuzzy your thinking gets. For instance, I have defined for you what political Islam is. It is the part of Islam that deals with me and those who are Catholics. Okay. Uh, Fact-based. I won't do all of complete. Here we go. I maintain that everything in Islam is based on there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And certainly, at the beginning of Islam, you become a Muslim by saying this in Arabic in front of witnesses. It turns out that not only is this the beginning of Islam, it is the totality of Islam, because the Quran is where we find Allah. And then we have those 92 verses in the Quran which talk about the need for everybody being like, in matter of fact, the whole world needs to live like Muhammad. Where do you get Muhammad? Well, there's a lot of Muhammad. Because we have the Sirah, the biography, and the Hadith. Now, I mentioned this earlier, I just wanted to show this to you. There are two Qurans. And by the way, sometimes Muslims don't know there's only one Quran, they don't know there's two. There's an early Quran and a Latin Quran. It's important to know this because the early Quran has some very beautiful language in it. The early Quran is generally religious. All right? It's highly repetitive, and it delivers the message that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Then we have the Medina Quran, which is enormously political. So just to know, because sometimes people get confused about this. In fact, have you ever noticed that people get confused? They go, oh, you have your religion, I have mine. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Gee, that sounds cool. I like that. Mm, but then there's those beheading verses, and we go, cut off the fingertips, and I'm like, I don't like that. 
The reason for this is, is Islam is based on dualism. There's no resolving these contradictions. You have your religion, and I have mine. It's an early verse, earlier than the ones what the jihadic verses. And they have to be true because of the word of Allah. So therefore, when the latter verses seem to contradict, they don't actually contradict, it's just the latter verses are better than the earlier verses. But all of it is true. So is Islam the religion of peace? Yes, it is. Is Islam the religion of jihad? Yes, it is. Whoa, Bill, let's contradict each other. The answer, the correct answer is, which is it? Is yes. <laughs> Here we go, I just quoted these. I shall strike terror into the hearts of the Kafir. You'll notice that I always use the Kafir. And by the way, why do I capitalize Kafir? Well, the Muslims get their name capitalized. Yeah. I'm as good as they are. So I capitalize it. When you're starting off, you can do those kind of things. Okay, here we go. Now, the thing I want to make with this point is, is that most, if you ask the average person in America what Islam is based on, they go, the Quran. That's easy. The Quran. Well, yes, it is. But in this photograph, which is taken on my kitchen table, you have the Sirah, the green book in the middle, which is 800 pages of fine print. It is some of the most difficult reading I have ever done. In fact, one time I, I reworked the Sirah into a shorter form that's easy to read. As a matter of fact, a teenager can read it. And my editor came to me and said, I don't understand this paragraph here. It has seemed to be ambiguous. I said, well, it comes from the original. She read the original and she looked at me and she said, is this whole book like this? I said, yes. She said, oh, my word. And she says, I can't figure it out either. So it's very difficult reading. Now, the Hadith, on the other hand, are fascinating reading and very simple to read. The shortest Hadith is, war is deceit. Then he goes, some of them are long, most of them are a paragraph, and they describe what Muhammad did. Why do they describe what Muhammad did? Remember those 92 verses? Live your life like Muhammad? So you need to know what he did and how he did it. We know more about Muhammad's life and his special habits and details than we do about George Washington. Oh, and George Washington. <laughs> I don't know. We know incredible details. We know his bathroom habits. Those are all recorded. They really are. How often he wiped his backside, what he used it for, how he urinated, how he drank a glass of water, how he spit. I mean, these details go on and on and on. They're all necessary for the Sunnah to be British and live. Now then, I do not discuss Muslims. God, there's a billion and a half of them. You know, which one would I pick to discuss? And then I got a call to study the Muslims, Muslimology, which is a fair term. And I occasionally will indulge certain Muslimology things, like Pew Research did a, a whole research on 38 nations that are Islamic or not so Islamic, but they ask Muslims a lot of questions. That's Muslimology. But I believe what I study is Quran, Sirah, Hadith. I study doctrine. And, but I've had people sit through a whole lecture on doctrine and walk away and say, oh, he's a Muslim basher. Didn't mention it. Now, they introduce me as a scientist, right? Yes. Scientists count and measure. If you can't measure it, if you can't define it and measure it, you're not dealing with science, really. It may be so preliminary it hasn't become science yet, but you need to measure it. I think this is fascinating. If you take those three books which you have on the table and count up how many words are in them, 14% is what the Quran is, and Muhammad, as you see, or as I like to say, Islam is this much Allah, that much Muhammad. This is important to know because it also gives you an insight on how to study Islam. I sell a course which I call the trilogy, Quran, Sarah, Hadith. And everybody wants to start with the Quran. Whoa, slow down. You don't want to start with the Quran, you want to start with Muhammad. Because once you understand Muhammad, the Quran is like, oh, yeah, that's what that's about. Muhammad is the context. Muhammad is also defines the timeline. The thing, the reason the Quran is so hard to understand is, it used to be a story. That is, the Quran was revealed, a verse, time. 
at a particular historical event. If you read the Quran in the right order, that is the right time order, and there's no big secret about this. Remember the abrogation thing, the earlier one is superseded by the stronger later one? You have to define what was later. Well, what defines that? Muhammad's life. You cannot understand the Quran without Muhammad. And he's the best place to start. So in my course and training on the trilogy, you start with the life of Muhammad, then you study the Hadith, and then you get to the Quran. So, Bill, could you, could you just tell us who wrote which? Who wrote what? Well, Allah wrote the first one. Uh, <laughs> the Quran. The uh, Gabriel. Okay? The writing of the Sirah is by Ibn Isaac. We don't have his original work, but we have a recension of his by his student. You also have the series in al -Tabari. And then there are two more, but those are the primary ones, Isak and al -Tabari. And then there are several collections of Hadith. There are six collections, I believe, which are called Sahih. And by the way, my pronunciation of Arabic has been condemned by every Arab. So don't repeat how I pronounce it, okay? But there are six collections, and I use the one that is considered to be the strongest and the best, which is by Bukhari. I've also, I'm the only person I've ever met who has read all 7,000 of Bukhari's hadith. And if that wasn't enough punishment, I sat down and read all of Abu Muslim's hadith, which are also 7,000 of them. I'm formidable in the debate. Besides, I find this stuff fascinating. I said that in Oops, running backwards. Okay, now then, I'm going to define Islam for you. In America, here's the way Islam is defined. Islam is the religion of the Muslim. Well, who is the Muslim? Someone who practices the religion of Islam. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is what is reported in the media. I say it is the doctrine, <clears throat> political and religious and civilizational found in the Quran, the Sirah, the Adi. That's what I define Islam to be. And that was an important statement. Earlier on that list, I said I'm not going to deal with completeness. We can now wrap our arms around Islam, Quran, Sirah, Hadith. I found this fascinating. Most of the Quran, <clears throat> the Sirah and the Hadith are about the Catholic. And I love bar charts. <laughs> but I already told you that. Now then, here's what's devoted to Jihad. Notice a clue here. The early Meccan Quran doesn't have any Jihad in it. Islam is a religion of peace. But the Medinan Quran, 24% of the verses are devoted to jihad. That is not a verse or two, and you just need to interpret the right verse the right way. 24%. That's heavy. Two-thirds of the Sirah is about jihad, and 20% of the Hadith. For total, about a third of the trilogy is about you and me. Ah, here's a long line. Is Islam for the Jew or against the Jew? The right answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Now, it's interesting. <clears throat> the only word in the Meccan Quran which is Ill, speaks, speaks ill of the Jews is in the 13th year of the writing of the Meccan Quran. What happened was, is that the Meccans got a belly full of Muhammad. And they said, look, he claims all this stuff about Gabriel and all this stuff, so let's go ask the Jews. So they sent camel riders, seriously, and they asked the Jews, Jewish rabbis, what do we ask this prophet about? And so the Jewish rabbis gave them some questions to ask the prophet. <coughs> Muhammad didn't like that. So the Quran changed in its treatment of the Jews. <coughs> and that's the 1%. In the Medina Quran, 17% of it is about the Jews, 12% in the Syria, 8.9% in the Hadith, for a total of 9.3% of the trilogy is about the Jews, and it's Jew hatred. Now, I went on a family vacation, and you need line reading. So I took my Kampf. <laughs> I'm the only man. Has anyone here read my Kampf in its totality? Okay. Did you count the number of paragraphs that related to Jew hatred? I did. 9%. 
So we'll let that stand as it stands. I've been a businessman. Sales, market. How you doing? This is the sales curve of Muhammad. What fascinates me is nobody ever plotted this up before. Taken directly from the syrup. And you can see it was a flat spot. <clears throat> and then when he got going, it took off like hot cakes. Now, here's the point. Islam is based on dualism. Okay? War or peace. Jew hatred, loving the Jews. You have your religion, I have mine, I shall cast tower. It is all of the above. And it is futile to say which one is the real Islam. No sense trying to. In my house, I have hot water and cold water. No one ever comes in and says, uh, Bill, which one's the real water? So don't ask which one's the real. Okay. This is the, uh, that's as far as I'm going to go with this, so I'll turn it off so it's not a distraction. I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> is Israel winning or losing in its battle against the so-called Palestinians? Yes. I say you're wrong. <laughs> I say Israel is losing. I measure that by America. I hear people saying things about both Jews and Israel that give me a chill. And by the way, some of the things they say about Israel are Jews. We held, I say we, I just came along for the ride, a Support Israel Day in Nashville, down at the Legislative Plaza. Now the Jews held their Support Israel Day at the JCC, a private event. But there's a, a Christian lady who's very big on Israel, and she did a public one. It was somewhat disheartening. I mean, we had, there were about 600 mostly Christians gathered. And there was a counter demonstration. What was difficult to explain when there were Jews, young Jews, on the other side, protesting the support of Israel. I sat down, <clears throat> I'm somewhat notorious in Nashville, small town. And so someone spent some political capital and got me to have a long coffee with two of the leaders of the Jewish community. We sat down and I said, I'm not here to tell you what I think, I want to know what you think. I'm surprised at that. Here's what they told me they thought. That Muslims in the South were like blacks in the South in the 40s and 50s. They were a persecuted minority. And that people like me were the persecutor. They said, you're a bigot and you're a hater. And people like you are the problem. If people like you did not exist, there would be no problem with Muslims at all. What we're going to do, <clears throat> this is a fairly accurate transcript. Well, not a transcript, a reporting. They said, we're going to love these people so much that they will never turn against us. I said, do we meet again? No. And one of them turned to his buddy and said, uh, Martin, we're the dialogue people. We're not going to meet with him again. Okay? I took a sales course one time. And so I needed to keep asking for the sale. So I said again, can we meet again? No. So I asked him a third time. This time I got a real response. Martin looked at me and he said, you are an unpleasant old man who goes around frightening people. He stood up and looked me square in the eye and he says, and if I knew what you know, I might become who you are. <laughs> and stormed out. What did he say? If I know what you know, I might become who you are. I found that interesting. I gave a talk to some conservative Jews who are Republicans. Some would say we met in the phone booth. It was in a private hall on a Sunday morning. And I gave a talk on <clears throat> Muhammad and the Jews. <clears throat> a gentleman sat as close to me as you are who was a university professor at Vanderbilt, a university professor at the top of the BB chain. And 
He said, look, I looked over the sign since I had 10 minutes to go and I lost my track. I'm serious, the fatigue thing is getting to me. I haven't had a good night's sleep in a while. He looked at me when it was over, and he was a university professor who taught Islamic philosophy amongst other of his courses. When I got through, he made this comment. Your talk today is original and provocative. Unfortunately, you would never be allowed to give this talk at Vanderbilt because we have resolved all the great issues. <laughs> While I spoke at Vanderbilt, I was invited in by a club of conservatives. When I got through, a man in the back of the room started standing up and screaming at me at the top of his lungs. You are a fool. You know nothing about Islam. You should never be allowed on a campus. Then he started repeating himself. He finally had to learn that people finally stopped, and he did. He then stood at the door to wave at me because a person came in and said, we have to turn the room. And a, a, a young friend of mine, who wasn't real sure about me at all, she's 21 years old, we went to the gentleman and said, he was the head of the Islamic Studies Department. And she said to him, you came to our class on Judaism 101 and told us that the Jews were protected. This man tells another story. He said, oh, these white wing conservatives, she said, I don't care about right and left, I don't know about Muhammad and the Jews. He turned on his heel and left. After that, she figured that I was telling the truth. I studied Torah at the Orthodox Synagogue for a year and a half. Interestingly enough, the rabbi who knew who I was never asked me a single question about Islam. I think that we need to change what we're doing and not try to change the State Department. I think we need to understand that after Saturday comes Sunday. And so what this means is, <clears throat> I'm always speaking in Nashville. We need to create alliances between the Saturday people and the Sunday people. There's something that meets in Nashville called the family of Abraham. The family of Abraham are good people. Okay? Very progressive, good people. They get together and they, they know nothing. And so the Imam and the Muslim Brotherhood scholars of these family of Abraham events, these the Christians and the Jews are like baby birds. They come and knock the morals in. And these are people who view themselves as good moral people. I think it is time to challenge these people directly with committees made up of both Jews and Christians. To call them by name, to say we want to meet with you. Because we have a far enemy, Islam, and a near enemy, the apologist for Islam. We will defeat Islam not by defeating Islam, but by defeating his near enemy. And that's the message I bring to you. Is both Christian and Jew must unite to deal with those Christians and those Jews who are supporting Islam. Now that doesn't sound like much of a strategy, but I've thought about it a long time. And I don't see another way. These people do not intend to be evil. They do not intend to be bad. As a matter of fact, their whole thought is to be good people. And so what we need to do, and this needs to be done in private. However, I dream of the day when the 300 family of Abraham get together and I could bring in 200 Christians and Jews to dominate the meeting. This is critically important because there are hot spots in this whole affair and these hot spots need to be attacked. And the family of Abraham and all these, these are religious dialogues. And by the way, I don't have a problem with religious dialogue. I was, I was raised a Christian, became a Buddhist. Uh, I even started the study of Sufism. So I'm big on religious dialogue. I don't have a problem with that. But I think religious dialogue should include fact-based reasoning and the ability to speak in any way. So, I claim that we need to find where the strong parts of Islam are in our country. And they are found amongst the Christians and Jews. They're the biggest supporters. And that we need to create committees of Christians and Jews, the Saturday people and Sunday people, who will contact them and say, we want to meet with you. And they won't want to meet with you, I know. I sat down and wrote 64 letters to these people, directly, first class mail, hand addressed, sent to their home. One of them offered to speak to me. It was an hour and a half meeting when I walked into the car. <clears throat> you ever noticed in some meetings you get the real truth in the last 60 seconds? As I opened the car door for him, because he's older than I am, he looked at me and he says, the problem is, is we are corrupt and afraid. Close the door and go off. We need to deal with the fear, we need to deal with the corruption. It's possible to do this. We know the truth, 
And by the way, you'll notice here that my idea on how to defeat and defend Israel is not with a foreign policy, but with a doctrine of Islam. Thank you.